is Go Beyond, the teaching and preaching ministry with Pastor Michael Eurisha. Michael is an international speaker, songwriter, and the senior pastor of the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, located in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. If you are ever in the greater Pittsburgh area, please come and visit us. Let's now join in with the Judah Ministries praise team at the Worship Center.
Hallelujah. Put your hands together. Welcome our global online congregation. Today, we thank God that we're reaching the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, he says, when this world is preached to all creation, to every nation, he said, then, somebody say then, then I'm going to return. I'm telling you, we're closer now than ever with satellites and internet. The word of God is going forth. The word of God is going forth. So today we are continuing our expository study of the book of James. The book of James. This is actually part seven. I didn't think it was really going to take us this long to get through these five chapters, but there's a, there's a lot in the book of James. Today we're going to be looking at chapter four. At chapter four. So very quickly... Just a quick review so we can get a running start into this morning. The last message, we spoke about the power of the tongue. The po- How many of you p- put some application to that this past week? Hallelujah. Can I see your tongue? Do I see any scar tissue in there? Anybody biting their tongue this past week? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> well, we thank God. We spoke about the power of the tongue Today, we could say the power of the thumb or the power of your fingertips because how many of you know we could send text messages, we could type messages on our computers and send them out, but there's dynamite, there's power in your words. A very familiar verse that we read last week wasn't out of the book of James, but it was out of the book of Proverbs. If you could throw that up there, Julius, it's Proverbs 18. Verse 21, the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it and indulge in it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. And as we broke this down last week, this does not necessarily mean that we have the power to speak life into things that are already dead. Although Jesus raised the dead, amen, we know there others have been raised from the dead over the centuries, but that's not what this verse is speaking about. When you read this verse, you have to read it in context because how many of you know we need to read the Bible in context because if we leave out some of the text, you can get stuck with a a con. So we have to read in context. And when you read this, just one sentence, it's an agricultural metaphor. In other words, you eat its fruit. So whatever seeds you sow, that in your garden will grow. So we are sowing and growing in our garden life. What are we sowing? What are we growing in our garden of life? If you speak words of death, and when I'm talking about words of death, I'm talking about gossip. You know, well, there's no gossip in the church. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh me, oh my, whatever, right? No gossip in the church. But whenever you speak words of death, meaning gossip or backbiting. How many of you know you're going to reap drama? You're going to reap bitterness. You're going to reap hatred. Uh, This will be your portion. This will be your harvest. So we need to discipline ourselves and sow words of life. If you sow words of life, you're going to reap uh, inspiration. If If you speak words of inspiration, you're going to If you speak words of encouragement, you're going to reap love and joy and peace and righteousness. How many of you know that we could use a whole lot of that in our lives? But it starts from the tongue. This fruit will grow in your garden. So James also uses the metaphor for the tongue as a rudder on a ship. I'm still reviewing. The rudder on a ship is relatively small, but it directs this huge seagoing vessel. It sets its course. So our tongue, James says, can set the course of our life. What are we speaking? How many of you know that the tongue can direct you either into a time of war or a time of peace? How many times have you started war with that little piece of flesh between your teeth? You could have kept your mouth shut. Could have kept your mouth shut, but nope. You had to go jump into that war, but Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. We need to be peacemakers. And lastly, James writes that the tongue has the power to set your whole course of life on fire. Not just a day or a season, but your entire life. Your entire life can be set on fire just by the words that you speak. So in summary, choose your words wisely. Choose your words wisely. Think 
before you speak. Be quick to listen, be slow to speak. Are you with me, somebody? Yes. Quick to listen, slow to speak. Everything that goes through your brain, how many of you know, doesn't have to come out your mouth? Mm. Especially when you're under pressure. Especially when you're under pressure, because when pressure's high, how many of you know words tend to fly? Words you wish you could have taken back. Now, the antidote for words inappropriately spoken are more words that are called fire extinguishers. And I gave you some examples. They're simple words, simple phrases. One fire extinguisher is, I'm sorry. Another word is, forgive me. How about, I love you. An authentic apology, saints of God, can put a whole lot of fires out. It can create a whole lot of healing in our families. Somebody say amen. It could cause a whole lot of healing in our communities, in our churches. Once again, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, not the war makers. Don't be a war maker in your home. Be a peacemaker. Amen. So we're keeping in mind that James, his letter is very practical and instruction. It's written to the church. In the very opening, it says that it's written to the 12 tribes of uh, Israel scattered throughout the area. So it's written to the church. So let's jump into James chapter 4, verse 1 through verse 3. Talking to the church, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire, that desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. So where do wars and fights come from among the household of faith? James accurately describes that strife and contentions among Christians with the terms he uses, wars and fights. And sometimes, unfortunately, the battles that happen among even Christians are bitter and they're severe. And many times it's over, watch this now, something that's really not that big of an issue in the grand scheme of things. Uh, my mama used to tell me, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Come on, have you ever heard that saying before? Sometimes we'll take some just little offense and we'll make a nuclear war out of it. So, you know, something isn't that big. You know, the saying that they have today, you know, or do you really want to die on that hill? Sometimes it's better just to let go and let God. Do I got a witness in the house? Verse 2, uh, James states, he says, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill or you murder. Now, listen, church, listen, listen up. This is a metaphor. <laughs> the church back in that day wasn't physically killing each other. Today, we're not literally killing each other over disputes in the household of faith. What this verse is stating that you aren't getting your way, so now you're hating. Hmm. So you begin to develop a disdain for a brother or a sister, and now there's a coldness between the two of you. Listen, saints of God, this ought not be. Paul made it very clear in Ephesians chapter 4 that we need to make every effort, every effort. Come on, somebody say every effort. That means it takes work. That means it's going to take forgiveness. That means it's going to take, I'm sorry, that means it's going to, uh, you know, to take a back seat once in a while. He says make every effort to keep the unity of faith. So the source of these wars and fights among Christians is always, almost always the same. There is some root of carnality. There is an internal war within the believer regarding the lust of the flesh. Every battle that goes on in the household of faith, listen, is not necessarily a spiritual war. Did you hear me? However, how many of you know it can be instigated <laughs> by a spirit? Listen, listen, listen. The devil can use anybody's mouth. Just ask Peter. <laughs> Peter and Jesus in the same chapter, Peter says, truly thou art the Christ, 
Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but it was revealed to you by the Spirit of God. Just a verse later, <laughs> Peter tells Jesus, he says, no, 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 no. You're not to the, going to the cross. Jesus looked right at Peter and he said, Satan, get thee behind me. <laughs> out, of the, out of the same mouth. Are you following me? So listen, listen, I, don't get your mouth up too high because listen, the devil could speak through anybody. Don't be throwing no tomatoes at me now or anything. I'm just telling you what the word of God is stating here. Now remember, saints of God, there are three voices within you. There's your voice, there's the devil's voice, and there's God's voice. So here it is. Listen, learn to discern. Come on, somebody say that with me. Learn to discern. Learn to discern, discern those voices that are speaking to you. Almost all who have such a critical and contentious attitude claim that they are prompted or led by the Spirit of God. You know, the holier-than-thou attitude. Uh, have you ever recognized that in the household of faith? Ever? Huh? Ah. Huh. When someone, listen, when someone always plays that card, God told me, or God showed me, or God spoke to me during a time of contention. Listen, I'm just giving you a caveat. Beware. Did you hear me? Beware. I'm not saying that they didn't hear from God, but take it with a grain of salt because nobody, somebody say nobody. Nobody, nobody hears perfectly. Every word, every prophecy, every dream, Every vision should be judged and weighed out. That's what my Bible teaches me. How, now, now listen, listen, I absolutely do believe that God speaks to all of us by the power of his Holy Spirit. Are you with me, Judah? God speaks to all of us. He speaks through his Holy Spirit. He speaks through the grafe, the written word. He speaks through the rhema, the revelatory word, or the still small voice. He also speaks through the phone, another Greek word, meaning the audible voice of God. Now, very few, uh, if any of us, have heard the audible voice of God. In other words, when I'm talking about the audible voice of God, I'm saying when God spoke to you, other people around you heard that same word. Very few of us can give that testimony, but we see that in the Word of God in Jane, or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter three, when Jesus is down at the River Jordan and he is getting baptized. The Bible says that he was there, and there was a voice that spoke from heaven that said, "This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased." The Bible is clear to say that everybody around heard the phone, the audible voice of God. Are you with me? Somebody say amen. We see it in, I believe it's Acts chapter 19. I think it's in verse 19 or 20 where it says that Paul, well, he was Saul at that time, was riding his high horse and he got knocked off the horse. And a voice spoke from heaven that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It was the phone voice of God. It was the audible voice of God because the Bible says that even Saul's companions heard that voice and wondered who was speaking. Even Paul said, hey, who is it? It's Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. So listen, the, how many know God is still speaking today? God is still speaking today. Every word that you receive isn't necessarily from the mouth of God. Let me say this again. Learn to discern. Every dream you have isn't from heaven. Let me tell you something. It could be from that late night Taco Bell. Yeah, that'll mess you up. Hot sauce after 11 p.m. is not a good idea, somebody. Give you some kind of nightmares. But I can't tell you, listen, saints of God, how many times I thought that I heard the Lord's voice and it was not him. I moved out in my own motivation. I moved out in my own, come on, am I talking to somebody in this house? I moved out in my own selfishness or my own will. Did God use my wrong decisions? Absolutely. Why? 
Because the Bible says that something, no, no, no. Most things, no, 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 no. All things work together for the good for those who love him and are called to cord, according to his purposes. So even when you move out in your own flesh, if you allow God, he can work in those bad decisions. He can work throughout those missteps in your life. All things work together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, many times the conflict arises when two people watch, hear two different words from God. Yes, sir. Yeah. Come on, have you been around the church? You've seen this. Well, I heard from God. Well, I heard from God. But yet they're diametrically opposed. Listen, that is impossible because the Holy Spirit is never in conflict with himself. So James makes it abundantly clear that this contentious manner comes from our desires, comes from your desires. It's self-evident that the Spirit of God does not create desire within you that is based in pride, that's based in envy, that's based in selfishness. Let's move on. Verse 2, James chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Now, this chapter jumps around a little bit. Remember, it's kind of like the book of Proverbs. So I hope you're not getting whiplash as this message moves on. It says this, you do not have because you do not ask God. Verse 3, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, this, this here is, is, is pretty simple, saints of God. And step one, we have not because we ask not. Many of us are guilty just because we don't ask. Don't ever be guilty of not asking God for whatever it is you need. Listen, we need to understand this. Our relationship is father-son, father-daughter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How many of you, you know, when you were thirsty and you were four years old, you went and you asked your mother, you asked your father for a drink of water. You didn't just sit around and were they ever going to give me a drink. No, you went and you asked. And they gladly gave it to you. Saints, we need to have that same concept in our mind with our Heavenly Father. So number one, you have to ask. Number two, what is the motive of our asking? Uh, are we asking just for our simple needs to be met? Or are we asking something that we can impress our family, friends, and our coworkers? Hmm. The Bible says in Hebrews, I'd like you to turn to Hebrews if you have your Bible there, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. It says this. It says, for the word of God is alive and it's active. Yes, yes, yes. Let, me, let me just break this down for a minute here. The word of God, it's the logos. Remember, there's several words in the Greek language for the term word. One is graphe, the written word, the rhema, the revelatory word, the phone is the audible voice of God, the audible word. Another one is logos. Logos means word. Logos more accurately means the, in, in the intention of my thought, the expression of my thought. For example, we see that in John chapter 1 verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the? The word. In the beginning was the logos. And the logos was with God. And the logos was God. Later on it says, the logos became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Logos was Jesus Christ. He was the expression of the thought of God. Did you follow that? Somebody say amen. amen. So it says that the Word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrows. Here, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account, including, listen, our motives. So in this passage, uh, this sword, this word, is it purpose to battle your enemy. It's purpose to battle my thoughts and your thoughts, my emotions, my attitude. How many of you know that your emotions lie? All the time. All the time. How many of you know your thoughts can lie? How many of you know 
that the heart of man is desperately wicked. It's deceitful. So these folks say, oh, just follow your heart. Please don't take that advice. Because it will definitely lead you down the wrong path. So the word of God is purposed to reveal our true motives, our true objectives. So what James is directing us to do is that when we are in conflict, when we are in need, ask God, but we must ask with correct motives. We must remember that the purpose of prayer is not to persuade God to align with our will. The purpose of prayer, saints, is to direct and to align our will with his will, that we might accomplish his will on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even Jesus said, Father, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Let's go on. Verse 4. And remember that he's writing this to the church. He says, you adulterous people. That's some hard preaching right there. These aren't my words. I'm just reading you the word of God. Are you all with me here? I, Michael did not call you an adulterous people. Somebody help me say amen. amen. Say, we still love you, Pat. I'm not calling you an adulterous people. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Now watch, follow this. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God? Or do you think Scripture says that without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. Somebody thank God. That is why Scripture said God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So, James is calling out the church here. He says, you adulterous people. Why? Because, listen, even though we are part of the household of faith, how many of you know we can still desire the things of this world? All right, you're getting quiet on me, but that's okay. It's called idolatry in the life of a Christian. But our Bible says to have no other gods before him. There is a battle raging on in the heart of every saint as to who is going to be number one in your heart. James, however, just makes a blanket statement stating the things of this world. Listen, this could be anything from wealth to popularity to how many likes you get on Facebook or uh, YouTube or whatever. It could be education, going up the corporate ladder. Your, uh, uh, your things of this world could be a substance addiction, food addiction, your children. It could be your grandchildren. It could be anything. To share a quick testimony with you, when I first got saved, I was on my way to church one morning, and as I'm driving to church, I had my cassette player because, you know, I was brought up in music and I was, music was going to be my career, so music was my life. And I was listening to a cassette. How many of you still remember the cassette players in the cars? Did, did you ever have them cassette or even eight tracks? How many of you remember the eight tracks? All right, right? When that tape, it all came out, got all wrinkled up. <laughs> then you were like reeling it back together. And every time it came past that little, you would Anyhow, I digress. <laughs> so I'm riding to church one day, and I had a cassette playing, and I was listening to music, and it was like the Spirit of God was in my car. And it was just like all of a sudden there was a shift in my life that that music, it was like it was dead. It was dead. There was nothing to it because, see, I had now been exposed to praise. I had now been exposed to worship. I've now been exposed to life. I've been now exposed to what happens as we praise God. Uh, you know, his blessings don't come down, but his, the blesser comes down because he inhabits the praises of his people. Are you following me, church? So, see, as I was experiencing that now, now the thing, I was listening to this music, and it was like, oh, my God, it's not doing anything for me anymore. So that afternoon, I go home. Home and I grabbed my stack of albums. I had a stack. Anybody used to have the LPs, records? Come on. I know I'm, I know I'm talking to some people of my age, right? Big ones. 
So I took them all, and I had a collection of dozens and dozens of t-shirts for all the concerts, because I was a major concert girl. I went everywhere to concerts. So I had t-shirts from all the girls, and I took them up to my parents' business, and out back they used to have a, a burn barrel. How many of you remember the burn barrel? Come on now. People used to burn garbage. You ain't allowed to do that anymore. I put it all in there, dumped a little gasoline on it, and whew, burned them. Radical. I'm, I'm telling you, it was like God spoke to me. I was set free. I didn't want anything, listen, to separate me from his presence. At that time when I did that, I wasn't even aware. You could go look this up later if you want to do a little homework assignment. Go look up chapter uh, Acts chapter 19, verses 19 and 20. The Bible says they had a church meeting, and all the fortune tellers, all the soothsayers uh, came together, and they burned all their sorcery books. They burned their Ouija boards, if you will. They burned their tarot cards. And they, the Bible says this. Check this out. It says when they added up everything they burned, it was worth, I think the number is 50,000 drachmas. A drachma was a day's wage. If you calculate that out today, they burned about five million dollars worth of nonsense. I guarantee there were some folk in that crowd. Can't we go sell that down the street and build a bigger church? But they didn't want anyone else to have access to the evil side. They didn't want anyone to have access to the devil. So they burned it and gave God the glory. We're talking about five million to six million U.S. dollars. Now let me make myself clear, church. Listen, we're all traveling down the road called sanctification. Some of us are further along than others upon salvation. Some of us were immediately delivered. Come on, do I got a witness in the house? When I got saved, it was immediate. Some God really just delivered me immediately. I was set free from the things of this world, but uh, all of us are still struggling with certain things on some level. Another quick testimony, when I was, got saved when I was 21, but between the ages of 17 to 21, I could not wait till my 21st birthday. Come on, how, what happens at your 21st birthday? I was legal. <laughs> I couldn't wait till that day. So April, I turned 21. October, I got saved and drank a new wine. Come on, somebody. <laughs> hey. And I tell you, I had six months of legal drinking activity because the day the Holy Ghost came into my life, that old wine was gone and God brought in the new wine. Come on, somebody in the house, give our God a praise. But listen, I was saved, sanctified. I was redeemed by the blood. But in my mid-20s, listen, I started making a lot of money, a lot of money. And there's nothing wrong with having money. Somebody say amen. I've had money and I've didn't, I didn't have money. But let me tell you, it's always better to have money. Somebody say amen. See, there's so, so there's not a problem when you have money. The problem is when money has you. Ah, uh, there's a big difference. Come on, I'm talking to somebody here. Uh, it's when money has you, when it becomes your focus, when you begin to compromise your spiritual life, when you begin, begin to compromise your relationship with God for the sake of the things of this world, whenever it is, whenever, whenever, whenever that happens, listen, you're in trouble, saints of God. My Bible tells me, we just read it, anybody who chooses to be a friend of the world, you become an enemy to God. Now, sometimes it takes a few beatings to get that world up and out of you. I've had to take quite a few beatings. Sometimes God needs to grab that two by four. In my case, he needed a four by four. He needed that rod of correction upside my head for quite a while before I released it. Listen, listen, I'm trying to tell you I was saved. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I was speaking in tongues. I was serving in the ministry. But I still had an affection for the things of this world. But God, somebody say, but God. But God. Disciplines. 
those whom he loves. Hebrews chapter 12 says that's proof that we're his children, that he disciplines us and is correcting us and rebuking us and pulling on our shirt tail to say, leave that thing alone. Leave that guy alone. Leave that girl alone. Leave that joint alone. Our Father loves us, so He disciplines us. Otherwise, the Bible says, let me speak King James, it says that we're bastards or illegitimate children. But God loves us that much that He's going to discipline us. Our Father, God, longs to fellowship with us. But sin, but the lust of the world, the eyes and the pride of life, they separate us from God. It may not uh, be even overt sin. It could be inward sin. It could be our attitude towards one another. Verse 5 goes on to say, watch. It says, or do you think that Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Listen, saints of God, God created us at conception in our mother's womb and placed his spirit, a spirit, I'm sorry, in us. Period. Thank you. And he is jealous for that spirit that he placed in us. He does not want us flirting around with others. Some think some scholars think that James is drawing this passage off of the story about Hosea and Gomer. That's not Gomer Powell. How many are familiar with Gomer Powell? Some of you old heads. Gomer is a woman's name in the Old Testament. Hosea was a man. Hosea, God told Hosea, listen, brother, go marry this woman named Gomer. I, I, I don't know. I'd have a hard time calling my wife Gomer. I'm just being honest with you. But Gomer was a woman of the night. She was a prostitute. She was a slave. He said, go purchase her. And when he purchased her from the slave block, he purchased her as an adulteress and he married her. How many of you know today that God also purchased us off of the slave block? Oh, come on, somebody in the house. We were all slaves to sin. We were all idolaters. We were all adulterers. And we were all running after other gods. But thank God, we were ransomed. We were bought for a price. And the price was the blood of Jesus. So hear me, saints of God. God is jealous for you. God is jealous for me. He's crazy about us. He longs for us and was willing to pay the ultimate price by sending his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us from the slave block of this world. Come on, somebody in the house. So it grieves him when we turn our affections away from him and toward the things of this world. So James goes on and gives us direction how to escape the temptation of the idolatry of this world. Verse 7. In verse 7 it says, submit. Somebody say, submit. Submit, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How about that for good preaching, huh? Verse 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. He's speaking to the church. Purify your heart, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Yes. So let's break this down. There's three steps here. Number one, it's submit to God. We should submit to God because, number one, he created us. We submit to God because his rule is good for us. We submit to God because all resistance to him is futile. Come on, I give you that analogy all the time. If you're wrestling with God, tap out. You're not going to win. Give it up. We should submit to God because he is the only way to have peace with God. So number one, submit to God. Number two, resist the devil. In the Greek, this is two words. It means to stand against. How many know the Bible says we need to stand against? It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. So when, not if. How many know it's a when? 
Evil days are coming. It's not an if. It's a when. Temptation is coming. It's not an if. It's, it, it's a when. Trials and tribulation are coming. It's not an if. It's a when. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to, here it is, stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, what do we got to do? Stand again. Stand firm then. So we need to stand against the devil when he comes against us. And number one, we submit. Number two, we resist. We stand against. Number three, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We used to sing a song back in the day. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Anybody ever sing that song? Maybe that was just our church. <laughs> and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Listen, that's good doctrine, church, because the closer we draw to the Lord, the less important the things of this world become. Come on, do I got a witness in the house? How many in here, now that you've been saved for a while, the closer you draw to God, the less important the things of this world have become? It's a process, remember. It was one thing to get the Israelites out of Egypt, but it was a whole other thing to get the Egypt, Egypt out of the Israelites. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Listen, listen, this is good. He will never, somebody say never. never. He will never reject you. Never. Hell is full of people, not because God rejected them, but because they rejected him in the manner of his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Jesus never turned away anyone. It's God's promise to us. If we draw near to him, he will reciprocate and draw near to us. He goes on to say, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded, meaning we need to repent, even as Christians. This is talking to the church, somebody. Yes, Repentance isn't a destination, it's a journey. Sure, we are absolutely justified upon our initial repentance when we cry out for salvation. But how many of you know sanctification requires repentance all along the way? Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he says, by the Spirit of God, we are led from glory to what? Glory. To glory. From glory to glory. In the Greek, it's doxa to doxa. Doxa means opinion. It means worldview. It means as we move along with the Spirit of God, our opinions change, our thoughts change. How many of you all think differently now than the day you first got saved? about a myriad of issues about I mean we could go through the whole list about a myriad of issues as we go through the life as we go through life with the Holy Spirit he changes our mind it's called repentance it's all called metanoia it's I used to think this way now I think this way come on are you wit come on do I got a, a witness in this house God has changed your mind the more we respond to his presence the more we respond to his word the more we are transformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Listen, Saints of God, we have two choices. You either humble yourself or you're gonna be humbled. Take your pick, take your pick. Now listen, this does not contradict when the Bible in Hebrews states that we can boldly go before the throne of grace. Boldly, in the book of Hebrews, when it's written, it does not mean that we go before God with arrogance. That's right. It does not mean we go before him with conceit. We boldly go before the throne of God. It means to go with frankness or complete vulnerability. It means to be going before God when you're completely honest and when we come to God that way the Bible says he will lift us up yeah. verse 11 brothers and sisters do not slander one another yeah I think I'll go ahead and read that one again <laughs> brothers and sisters do not slander one another anyone who speaks against a brother or a sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it when you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. 
Verse 12, there is only one lawgiver and one judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now, let me take a couple of minutes here because this word judge has been horrendously taken out of context by the world because they love to quote Matthew chapter 7. Well, Jesus says, don't judge me. Once again, we read things in context. Do you know in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus wasn't telling anybody to not judge a person. He was telling them how we should judge somebody else. He says, listen, how can you get the speck out of your brother's eye if you still have a board in your own eye? Take care of the board. Are you hearing me, somebody? Get your own vision correct first. Once you do that, now you can help somebody get the speck out of their eye. Well, how do we get the board out of our own eye? It's called reading the Word of God because it will clarify your vision as to what's going on. Come on, if somebody's hearing me this morning, somebody help me and shout amen. amen. So the Bible says that we're not to judge one another. In the Greek, there's two different words for judge. We've gone down this road several times, but let me do it again. The first one is bima. We are going to be judged as Christians, but the bima seat was a seat on a platform where the judge sat that after you competed in the athletic games, you came before the bima seat and you were judged. Are you hearing me? They put the crown on your head because you were receiving your reward. Oh, come on, somebody. I hope you're getting this. So on that day, when we go before Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we are going to go before the Bema seat, and he is going to give us our just rewards. We're going to an awards ceremony. Are you hearing me? That's the Bema seat. But the word that Jesus used, and the word that's used all through James here, is the word krino in the Greek. Krino means the reading of a verdict or the casting of a sentence. We have no right, nor do we have the authority to cast somebody into hell. We don't have that right or authority. Are you following me? So we're not to tell anybody. I don't care who they are. You're going to hell. Oh, go ahead, pastor. Just keep on preaching there. But let me tell you, the world, they try to distort this word judge just like the devil did in the garden. They tried to distort it so that they may live their debaucherous lives unimpeded. We're living in that day where no judges, like when there were no judges and everybody did was right in their own eyes. However, listen, there is a judge. There is a judge somebody. So don't be confused by the world who is very good at distorting word definitions. There's a lot of it going on today. We can certainly make judgments, or let me use this term, we can make assessments, might be a better word. It's our godly obligation to evaluate. It's your godly obligation. I hope you're hearing me. To evaluate and to judge situations. Second Timothy 1 and 7 says, For I have not given you a spirit of, but of power, dunamis, of love, agape, and sophrenisimo, a sound mind, which simply means common sense. So your sound mind should tell you, don't play with a loaded gun. Your sound mind should tell you, don't let a pedophile babysit your child or your grandchild. Well, don't judge me. No, I am judging you. I'm making an assessment. I don't want a pedophile around my children. 
You call me a hater, call me a bigot, call me a whatever phobe. I'm just using my soft renisi most. I'm using my sound judgment. Let me ask anybody in here. Do you want your teens hanging out with the local drug dealers and the gangs? No, you have to assess the situation. You have to make a judgment. Do you want your kindergartner spending their story hour with a drag queen? Sophronisimos, you have a sound mind. You need to make that judgment. So you need to assess, you need to evaluate, you need to judge the situation. So God has given you a sound mind. Here, let me tell you something. Use it. Make godly judgments. Make godly decisions. Come on, somebody in the house, give our God a praise. Please don't let the world try to co-opt you in this don't judge me nonsense. Let me wrap it up. Verses 13 through 17. It says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this city, spend a year there, carry on business, and we're going to make money. Well, you do not even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a midst that appears for just a little while whew, and it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live, we will do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. So James is not saying this. He is not saying don't make plans for the future. Because the Bible is replete with verses about planning. Full of verses about planning. How many of you know if you fail to plan, if you plan to fail? That's it. That's it right there. Proverbs 21 and 5 says the plans of the diligent surely lead to abundance. Our Operation 25 every Friday, Pastor Kim doesn't just show up without a plan. You got a plan? Got a plan. <laughs> Friday night, we have youth ministry. Gary and Sherry don't come here and just, oh, what are we going to do? No, there's a, there's a plan. We're taking a mission trip. We don't just show up at the airport. Okay, what are we doing? I don't know. Let's just buy some air tickets. And with... does, it, does it seem like nonsense, right? No, you got to make plans. So that's not what James is saying. We need to make plans. Just don't make your plans. Listen with arrogance and pride. Learn to use the phrase, yeah, we're going to Africa, the Lord willing, because Michael might not make it till tomorrow. There's, your life is but a vapor. It's like a mist. My God. How many of you on the north side of maybe 40 or 50 or certainly 60 or 70 know those years went quick? It just seemed like yesterday. <laughs> we was changing diapers. Should I say this, Holy Spirit? <laughs> Y'all know I love you, right, Judah? <laughs> yeah, and let me say it this way. Because we used to change the children's diapers. But some of those rules <laughs> have reversed. Come on, you know what I'm <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I could not let that go. <laughs> but how quick. My gosh, we were just putting our children in car seats and taking them around and giving them bottles. <laughs> now they're giving us bottles. <laughs> but life is a vapor. It, in the grand scheme of things, it's a mist. The Bible So let me get my back to my notes so we can wrap this up. Oh, my gosh. So, verse 17, it says, anyone that knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, James says, the Word of God says, it's sin for them. In other words, don't they say to yourself, after I build my business, 
after I start my career, after I get so much money in the bank, when my children grow up, then I'll begin to tend to the things of the kingdom of God. Remember what Jesus said about the guy in Luke 12? He said, I'm going to tear down these barns because my business is expanding. I'm going to build new barns so we can have more. Then I'm going to retire. I'm going to sit along the beach and sip lattes and uh, enjoy life. Jesus said, you fool. You don't know that your soul's going to be required of you tonight. That's what James is trying to get across here. Jesus says, then what? Then what are you going to do with all that wealth? You leave it to your kids to squander? Come on, somebody. James is saying, if you know the good to do, watch. If you know the good you ought to do, if you know the ministry that God has called you to or that you should be involved in, if you know it and you don't do it, that is sin for you. So do not procrastinate the things of the kingdom of God. Jesus said, goes on to, about the guy, guy with the, the wealth. He says, if you store things up here on earth, must, moth, rust, doth corrupt. But rather store up for yourselves what? Treasures in where neither thief will steal nor moth or rust will corrupt. So listen, church, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about something and you don't do it, if you know there's good that you ought to do and you don't do it, the Bible said it is sin to you. So in summary, once again, the book of James is much like the book of Proverbs. It's chock full, chock full of very practical advice and wisdom for the believers as to how to live a victorious, healthy life in Christ. But how many of you know we need to not only be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word of God? Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and give our God a praise in the house. Come on and stand to your feet. to proclaim